Welcome back yet again to the Demon Slayer comparison series. Today we'll cover the legendary episode 10 of the District Arc, which covers the remainder of chapter 92, chapter 93, and chapter 94. This might just be one of the best Demon Slayer episodes of all time. So without further ado, let's get right into it. After the recap and the opening, we watch Tanjiro and Nezuko hit the ground, and as Tanjiro is apologizing some more, we jump into our first manga panel of the day, with Nezuko schooling Tanjiro. This panel is right after we left off last week on page 8 of chapter 92. Besides some extra shots here, this dream sequence is probably the closest the manga and anime get this entire episode. Nezuko's lines do change slightly depending on the version, although it mainly comes down to Tanjiro always finding a reason to say that he's sorry. Once Tanjiro wakes up from his dream, he now gets some time to himself instead of waking up immediately to Gyutaro's face like he does in the manga. Here we can see that the stage is already set for a battle amongst the flames, whereas no flames are really ever visible in the manga from here on out. This is likely for atmospheric effect, as well as giving UFO Table the excuse to use that reddish compositional value for that extra punch to their scenes. Since Tanjiro now has some time to himself, he reflects and ponders where he and everyone else is, and also gets the chance to check up on and thank Nezuko for that speech of hers in his dream. And with newfound courage, he lifts his head up to the heavens only for it to show him hell instead. This oppressive sight is what puts us back into sync with the manga. Not long after Gyutaro starts his verbal abuse, we see a little earlier that Daki is watching the whole thing from the rooftops, right as rain. And as Gyutaro now gets real close to Tanjiro, he rubs it in how pathetic the rest of his crew is. Some of these scenes are a little different. For one, it seems like Inosuke fell to the ground instead of remaining on the roof, and Zenitsu is no longer reaching for his sword like he is in the manga. Rather, he's just straight trying to get out. Maybe because he's aware that UFO Table added fire onto the building that he's currently getting crushed by. Tanjiro clearly doesn't like this little documentation by Gyutaro because his face now looks far more astonished and maybe even a little scared at his current predicament. After he hears Tanjiro's reply about Nezuko, we now actually watch Gyutaro kneel down to get closer to him, likely because we'll be seeing him kneeling a little later in the manga. From here, the anime shows him being much more deceptively gentle as he rubs Tanjiro's face before getting to the part where he snaps his fingers. Not only did Gyutaro pick up Tanjiro's hand in a different way, he also broke his fingers in a different way. See, in the anime, Gyutaro basically shoved Tanjiro's fingers into his fist before clenching real hard, kind of like when you finish a soda. In the manga, though, he's far more meticulous in the fingers he wants to snap as he grabs them individually. Adding insult to injury, Gyutaro starts smacking and pulling Tanjiro around as he throws various insults at him. And these insults do change depending on which translation you look at, but they're all equally hurtful in my opinion. Real quick, you might have noticed that some of Gyutaro's armbands can be missing in some shots. Now, the manga has skimped out on little details like this before, but it's worth mentioning that in the manga, these bands are less bands than they are garments that flow much more freely. I think that's enough of a pass in my book. After a flurry of quick cuts taunting Tanjiro to cut his head off, this is when Tanjiro's stranger danger instincts kick in and he runs off with Nezuko's box. I don't remember him actually putting her back in the box though. Maybe she just snuggled back in on her own? Regardless, this is when the manga and the anime really start to deviate because in the manga, Tanjiro never took off to run away from Gyutaro. Instead, he just puts his head down and grabs the perfume bag, two actions that we won't see him do until later. This means that we're working our way into anime exclusive territory. We're not quite there yet though because Gyutaro and Daki's reaction to Tanjiro running away is the same reaction they have to him putting his head down. Daki still smirks, and Gyutaro still says that he broke his spirit and the like. Funny how these reactions can work in both scenarios. It's after those lines that we officially move into anime exclusive territory as Tanjiro takes off into the night. Though while Tanjiro tries to get away, he doesn't get too far as he's kicked into a burning building and cornered at the end of the street. Tanjiro does throw some stuff as Gyutaro slowly approaches him, but that doesn't stop him from kicking Tanjiro right in the gut. It's at this slightly new location that we get back into sync with the lines of the manga, where Gyutaro says that he doesn't mind how pitiful Tanjiro Tanjiro is, though it looks like Yutaro decided to put his sickle down this time before he scratches his face. Maybe to show just how little he actually sees Tanjiro as a threat. He's so confident that this time he gets extra close to Tanjiro as he whispers how he'll kill his sister. Ever since Gyutaro showed up in front of Tanjiro, his sadistic and sinister nature comes through not just from the delivery of his lines, but the expert framing decisions on how Gyutaro looks in relation to the scene. Heck, these sights would be enough to break anyone's will, and that's exactly what Gyutaro was going for. But Tanjiro's will isn't shaken that easily, as in the anime, you can clearly see his disdain for Gyutaro's lines toward him and his sister. This is the trigger that'll put his plan into motion as he cocks back the trademark headbutt that fixes all situations. After Tanjiro activates his trap card, we can see Gyutaro feeling the effects of the headbutt a little bit earlier, before Daki has her lines telling her brother to get up. But this is far from the only change this scene has to offer, because after Gyutaro realizes that he's been stabbed, his rationalization for how this happened is much different compared to the manga. See, in the anime, Gyutaro says that Tanjiro must have run away earlier in order to find 
find a kunai to stab him with before mixing it with the scent of the perfume he threw at him. But as we all know, that came from an anime exclusive scene, so how did the manga describe this? Well, you see, the manga took an event from last chapter and incorporated it into this part. Let me explain. See, it's from this panel last chapter when Tanjiro and Hinatsudu were on the roof that Hinatsudu slipped Tanjiro the kunai before Zenitsu and Inosuke came in. I wanted to mention this last episode, but it would have been a spoiler for some. What I wanted to say is that back then, this kind of hard to make out shot of the kunai being slipped to Tanjiro just straight doesn't exist in the anime. It's an entirely manga only depiction. The only part of this rationalization by Gyutaro that is comparable is how Tanjiro mixed the scent of the perfume in order to negate the smell of the poisonous kunai, although he didn't actually throw the perfume bag in the manga. This is a very interesting change. On the one hand, the anime shows how tactfully quick Tanjiro can be in dire situations, but the manga shows just how amazing Hinatsuda's foresight really is. Personally, I love plot points that are set up chapters in advance, but I don't know. What narrative beat do you guys like better? Regardless, they both lead into the inevitability of Tanjiro trying to cut off Gyutaro's neck again. This time, though, it's very clear that Tanjiro used Hinokami Kagura for this attack, whereas it's not so clear in the manga. Now that the turns have tabled, this is where we end out chapter 92 and go right into commercial break. Both of the cuts in this break are basically the same, and they come from the title page of the chapter we'll be moving into, chapter 93. But before we get into that chapter, though, we get a short anime-exclusive cry from Nezuko shouting her brother's name before seeing Daki doing the same. Daki crying for her brother actually is in the manga, but not on page 2 when the chapter starts. No, we'll be starting on page 3 this time, as Tanjiro starts to see himself in Gyutaro's eyes. In addition to Tanjiro's usual lines about how he could have easily ended up like Gyutaro, there are now some inserted ones of him saying that he was lucky that both him and Nezuko didn't become demons together. From here we get some anime-only footage of struggling Gyutaro reaching for the kunai. Him yelling at the top of his lungs is actually what brings us into the beginning of the chapter on page 2, where Tanjiro is yelling as well. While this struggle is going on, we skip over the page we already covered and on to page 4 where Daki starts to intervene, as does Zenitsu as he emerges from the rubble. I like the manga's depiction here a little better because while it may not be as cool, it does keep us from wondering why Zenitsu decided to bury himself a little further than he was earlier. Though what I do like better in the anime is how they did this new rendition of Zenitsu's lightning moves. There's a new spin on it this time around, with much more jagged lines encompassing the trail that he leaves behind. There's a certain unrefined nature to the whole thing, as the colors literally flash between blue and yellow, maybe to reflect how worn out Zenitsu is at this point. I won't spend too much time on this though, we already covered most of this in the last video. After Daki realizes who's come to stop her, she gets one relocated line from just a little later on, telling the ugly freak to get lost. After some quick little sakugo, this is when Zenitsu activates what we now know as Godspeed again, and Daki seems confident enough to say her lines of nonsense out loud this time instead of in her head before Zenitsu taps into the speed force. Some translations call this move godlike speed, but Shinsoku can mean one or the other. Oh, and for those of you who actually watch Hunter x Hunter, Kilua's godspeed is pronounced komburu, not Shinsoku. Two different words, but very similar meanings. As we watch Zenitsu's godspeed, the lightning becomes more organic than ever as it splits off while twisting and bending its way into a straight path lane right to Daki's neck. In accordance with that, we get some of the fastest camera movement thus far as we fly past the entire render of the entertainment district, displaying the true speed of the attack itself. I love how inside the attack we can see some recoloration next to Zenitsu as the blue and yellow colors mix into a light green, but what I love even more is how they did these smear-like graphics to begin with. Besides the black lines here, the alpha effects around them are entirely unpredictable. They're very similar to the gravity-like overlay we saw when Tanjiro was holding Gyutaro on the ground. Very rarely I'll find some repeat graphics, but every time I do, the other graphics around them are entirely different. I get the feeling that UFO Table somehow managed to automate the process of how these graphics are added to the scene, but only the studio would know for sure. This might not be the case for every situation, as the yellow strips flying past the camera here are a little too specific in how they change from graphic to graphic while going from right to left. Unlike every Everything else, they change at a much more consistent pattern, albeit at different scales and rotational values. They're also assisted with some spot blurs here and there if you look closely enough. Zenitsu is barely moving here, but it feels like he's moving at a million miles an hour just from some well-crafted graphics flying into one point behind him. Him flying off with Daki is pretty much what you would expect from the manga, except Zenitsu's speed in the anime is portrayed on a whole other level. It's so fast that we don't actually even see his foot hit the ground right here. Instead, we see his bloody leg hovering over the ground with no rooftop in sight. Now, I was trying to avoid talking about Viz Media in this episode, but again they did something I just can't ignore. Zenitsu is supposed to say that he can only use Godspeed twice, and Viz Media says just once. Of all things to get wrong, this one's the most pathetic. It's a number, it's not that hard to translate. Jesus. 
Anyways, as Kyutaro is trying to get up, we get some more of that anime-only depiction from earlier as he goes for the kunai stuck in his leg. Except now he actually pulls it out with a blood-chilling scream before releasing his blood blades and forcing Tanjiro back. Again, we talked a great deal about these blood attacks in a previous video, so I won't mention them too much. Tanjiro being pushed back by Gyutaro is largely in tune with the paneling of the manga, but with its own incorporated Sakuga twists, of course. As Kyutaro chases down Tanjiro, it's amazing how much depth Yufo Table added to this scene. Almost as if this street they're fighting on could go on forever, and it's thanks to the amazing camera work that moves at a consistent speed throughout it all. At this point, Kyutaro would chase Tanjiro to the ends of the earth if Uzui hadn't intervened. And when Uzui does intervene with that legendary pose, he now does a singular slash towards Kyutaro instead of the three, and after the amazing Sakuga explosion, we get some additional Sakuga of Uzui doing some one-handed sword swinging. I absolutely love how he puts it in between his fingers here. He should teach that to Tanjiro someday. Though not today, obviously. After one additional Uzui-san from Tanjiro, this is where adrenaline-filled Uzui charges in and Gyutaro says one additional line before getting into the real guts of this episode. For Uzui's big battle with Gyutaro, there are some big changes here. But before this battle actually starts in the manga, we get some narration panels. They essentially say what Gyutaro will say a little later about how Uzui can turn enemy attacks into a song in order to negate them, but in a more dumbed-down way. We'll get back to this information a little later. That's only half the narration, though. The other half will be said by Tanjiro later on about how Uzui is at his limit just defending Gyutaro's attacks, and that he himself will have to be the one to deliver the final blow. In the background of these panels, we can see some of the battle going on while Uzui puts his musical score technique into effect. The anime extended this battle amazingly, as up until Tanjiro enters the fray, Uzui and Gyutaro's solo battle only encompasses about five or so panels depending on how you look at it, and that includes some of the narration panels from earlier. Which means that we'll be largely disconnected from the manga until Tanjiro makes his reappearance a little later. We'll get into the heart of the Sakuga itself in just a second, but first let's talk about this. As we zoom into Uzui's monochromatic ear, we see these red and blue streaks bleed into a rainbow of radial lights where we dissolve into a new scene entirely housed within Uzui's ear. It's in his ear that we see probably the best piece of 3D in anime period, as these characters in disjointed lines build themselves into musical sheets that wrap around each other far out into the distance. I've watched this scene so many times I couldn't even begin to conjecture how they did it. It might be a different story if this was above 24 frames per second, but since those detailed frames aren't here, we have to work with what we got. And what we've got are Japanese musical sheets, very akin to those which would be used to play the koto instrument or something similar. Now, I'm no musical composer, and certainly not a Japanese one, but I can read some of this here, blurry as it may be, and I can confirm that every note this sound lightning trail hit matched up with Uzui's attack, or at least what he said as he was attacking. Now, I assume there are more than some of you out there that can count in Japanese, but some of these characters and sounds may be confusing to even those people. That's because despite the Japanese Netflix subtitles writing the number one in what's known as Daiji, 11, 12, and 13 are pronounced differently. I'm not entirely sure why, nor am I positive in this assumption, but from the research I've done, the full range of Uzui's notes should be something like this. From these notes, the manga panel from earlier states that he can convert the rhythm of them in a way that creates a new song entirely. It just takes time for him to do this because he has to listen to the enemy's repeated phrases to figure out how to attack in between beats. Keep this in mind when looking at all of Uzui's movements from here on out. As Uzui is reading Yutaro's score, we get our first real taste of Uzui's one-handed sword style. Just like that one time when he extended his blade's reach, he's using every extension here to let his second blade follow through since they're both attached at the hilt. His moves feel noticeably looser and less restrained restricted than before. After one additional line from Uzui saying that he can read Yutaro's filthy score, we get some more 3D insanity as the scene goes monochrome and we pan out to the CG bloodified music sheets flying through the blood blades and toward Uzui. I like how Uzui is glowing blue here just like his attacks do, almost as if his very body is the weapon right now. As he continues to charge in afterwards, you can hear one of Demon Slayer's standout BGMs remixed with a piano track as if this battlefield is really becoming a musical playground for Uzui. During this score, accompanied by some low-shot Sakuga action, we get an additional sugoi from Tanjiro before Gyutaro backs up in an anime-exclusive fashion and reads out the narration panels we mentioned earlier before going back to how annoyed he is that Uzui is doing all of this with one arm. After these lines, Gyutaro jumps back in to start the fight to end all fights. Make no mistake, what you'll see from here on is one of, if not the best fight scenes that UFO Table has ever gifted this world. So let's break it all down. From the research I've done, Uzui and Gyutaro's final showdown is primarily done by two key animators. As always, key animators aren't always 
always credited by timestamps, so take this accreditation with a grain of salt. First up is Masayuki Kunihiro. He has a very specific way in how he makes his characters move. You may recall back in episode 6 I talked about Tanjiro's smoothly eased movement, yet some of those cuts were done by this guy before Nozomu Abe's multi-slash cut. His cuts tend to transition quite well into Abe's, as his pose-to-pose -pose style animation techniques are quite comparable and build very well off of each other. What's astonishing is that he knows all too well how his different poses will bleed into each other, assisted with some of the most impeccable timing work the industry has to offer. Every extreme pose done here has a gradual slow to fast speeding that makes it feel as if the characters are levitating for a brief second. It's highly stylized and not at all meant to be realistic. This stylization is what makes it easier for the audience to clearly follow the character for a brief moment before they swiftly and gradually transition into the next pose. Kunihiro's poses are so eccentric that it creates quite the imprint in our minds, making it easy for us to know exactly what's going on in the battle even when things start to speed up again. Animation style like this is important in UFO Table's work since a lot of their key animation can be distorted by the layers of composition put on top of it. Some of that composition does help us follow the action at times though, like how we see the blue strikes coming from Uzui and the red ones coming from Gyutaro. These cuts as well as the ones coming up are assisted heavily by the use of fast camera movement to keep the scene alive even as the character is going through their pauses to pose. After they crash into that building we start getting into what should be Nozomu Abe's cuts. Them flying out of the building where Uzui coughs up some blood before charging back in is the perfect setup to one of the craziest cinematic sequences of all time. Every cut prior constantly up the ante to keep our adrenaline running high just for this exact moment to blow the top off of everything. With their faces looking as crazy as they do as well as the music in the background reaching its climax, this scene is just pure adrenaline filled perfection. The entirety of the scene has a lot of cutaways to the characters faces and it fits the epic tone to a T. They're perfectly spaced between shots. Characters screaming with harsh line work will never not feel epic in anime. Props to Uzui and Gyutaro's voice actors for this scene. Outside of the screaming cuts, the movement here starts out in hyperspeed and gradually works its way to ludicrous speed after each cutaway. With how fast everything looks, you might not even realize that this isn't all done at 24 FPS. A good chunk of it is done on ones, but there's actually a lot of repeat frames here. Because of this, I thought Abe was forcibly speeding up the scene by upping the frame count over time and the cuts made consistently out of ones, but that's not the case. Instead, he focuses more on his pose-to-pose -pose action by having them stay in one place a little longer in one cut and then slowly but surely reduce the time that they stay in that one physical location. Now, you might be thinking that surely if they're standing in one location more in one cut and less in subsequent ones that he has to be upping the frame count, but it's really not because even if the characters are in the same location, he still has them moving their limbs setting up their next attacks. This movement is something only Abe could do. The way they basically dance around each other is pure eye candy. On top of which, since every new cut pans out the camera a bit, the scene slowly starts relying on the slashing effects themselves. Because the further out we go, the more we can see how their attacks are affecting more and more of the battlefield around them, and that gives us the illusion of more powerful moves being put off. The open structure of the destroyed entertainment district really helps in this regard. Over time, the movements of the characters themselves seem to be more of an afterthought as they start to get obscured by the destruction around them. Hell, in this last cut, they're barely moving at all. It's all about the representation of fast movement at this point, and the effects sell that quite well. And I know lately when I say effects I usually mean CGI, but these slashes and explosions are all 2D. I'm not sure if Abe was the one who did these effects or not, but either way, all the slashes are done at a consistent 24 FPS, adding to the pure grandeur of this scene. The explosions though might not always be on ones, but the panoramic nature of the camera distracts us from that fact. That and everything else going on. After the final wide shot of the two of them going ham, we get some more sick effect work as the explosions travel throughout the district. You may not have noticed this in this cut, but you can actually see Uzui and Gyutaro going from point to point leaving explosions in their wake. Just the colored lines they represent, not their actual character designs. It's incredible that UFO Table turned five panels into this. Not only is it the best anime exclusive segment in this series, it's the best animation period. Though my heart still kind of lives with Abe's cut of Tanjiro in episode 6. Before we move on to the next panel, we have some more anime exclusive stuff of Tanjiro closely following Uzui from the sidelines waiting for his chance. This is where he says those lines that were originally said in those narration panels all that time ago. As Tanjiro decides to get closer to them, this is when we finally get into the next panel of Uzui getting stabbed and losing an eye. While these two events are technically reversed in the manga, there's also some additional stuff, such as Gyutaro breaking the chain that connects Uzui's swords, as well as Uzui cutting off one of Gyutaro's limbs. These new representations are definitely important, as we see as much in future manga panels. From here, we briefly get the depiction of Uzui charging Gyutaro with his remaining blade down the street as Tanjiro jumps in. I'm actually surprised with how much gore UFO Table was able to get away with here. Some of the juicy details are missing, but these scenes are far more visceral than I ever would have expected. Up to where Tanjiro says in his head that he'll cut Gyutaro's head off for sure, this is where chapter 93 ends. Now in chapter 94, the first two pages are entirely 
unadapted as they contain nothing but narration panels. What they say mainly came down to two things. First that Kyutaro never mentioned that he had full control over his sister while he was fighting, although the Obi and Bloodblade attacks working in close tandem was enough to give that away. And second, the narrator gives us some inspirational lines saying that despite the poison and the clear difference in strength, it brought newfound effort to the group to always find another opening. While this is nice and all and it does introduce us into the next chapter, I'm glad they didn't put it in during this defining moment. That would break up the action way too much. Now on page 3, this is when Tanjiro strikes at Gyutaro's neck for the final time. Things are finally starting to match up panel for panel again, which means that now we finally get to see how Tanjiro's scar expands in an animated form. In the anime, it looks like the scar didn't so much expand as a new one flows over the old one as sparks fly off of his head. We also now get to watch his Super Saiyan Red transformation as his hair glows bright red while his eyes go completely blank. It seems like Gyutaro didn't notice this because the panel beforehand of him noticing the scar expanding is completely vacant in the anime. There's also one more unadapted panel here of Gyutaro saying that he is unable to pull his sickle out of Tanjiro's jaw, as well as how he needs to quickly regenerate his left arm in order to get Tanjiro off of his neck. This is one line I wish Gyutaro said because it's kind of reminiscent of how Ren Goku didn't let Akaza get away that one time by holding one of his arms in his stomach. For such a savage detail, it really should have been left in, in my opinion. This is where Gyutaro's lines about wanting to finish Zenitsu off first transitions us into Zenitsu, continuing his use of Godspeed. I love the new effect they got going here for Godspeed with these blue and yellow airbrush strokes. It's very unlike anything we've seen from Thunder Breathing thus far. As Zenitsu continues to plow forward, there are some new lines from him saying that he doesn't have much strength left before Daki tries to stop Zenitsu in his tracks. But this is when our final savior of the day comes in to slice up the Obi strands that would have otherwise skewered Zenitsu. Not only is it impressive that Inosuke is up and following Zenitsu close by, but how he's even talking at all, as his voice is basically flooded by his own blood as it spills out of his mouth. Inosuke's voice actor has earned my eternal respect after this scene. Right after he creates a cross slash to hopefully decapitate Daki, we'll skip ahead one page to where Daki cries for her brother's help, as well as Gyutaro saying he needs to unleash his rotating circular slashes move. It's after these two desperate lines that we go back one page to where we see the sick three-way shot of Tanjiro, Zenitsu, and Inosuke using all of their strength in tandem. Like the cutaways from Uzu and Gyutaro's battle, this is the sort of line work I'd expect from an anime moment of this caliber. It reminds me of some of the stuff I saw from the Naruto Storm games back in the day. It's incredibly dense and disorderly, not just from the lines around them, but the lines that encompass them. Moreover, I love how the background's color palette is getting lighter and lighter as it illuminates their faces in the foreground. This is the final strike, and UFO Table knows this well. The only thing that really changed from this page is that Inosuke is now yelling in a similar manner to the rest of them, instead of his scream being broken up a bit in the manga. At the very end, we get some final anime-exclusive footage from their respective sword techniques. Every technique that we've covered from these three comes down to this, and with a final burst of power, we see the final X-slash to both Gyutaro and Daki's head flying off at the same time. These two shots of them getting decapitated adapts a total of four pages from the manga, as each illustration covers two pages. UFO Table adapted this moment flawlessly, with some of the most satisfying sound work I've ever heard. This is one of the most epic moments in all of anime history, and truthfully speaking, I'm glad to be a part of that history. For the next page and a half, we watch their heads slowly roll towards each other as everyone collapses to the ground out of exhaustion. After we see the shot of both of the siblings looking at each other, we get three Three vacant manga panels of Uzui realizing that something is amiss with Gyutaro's body, before getting into the following panels of Suma being thrilled that they won. As some of you may have realized, these vacant manga panels are actually in the next episode, but we'll save that for the next video. For now, let's talk about this shot with Suma. UFO Table's background art is certainly not to be trifled with, as we get a full view of the carnage this battle has left in its wake. It's quite the atmospheric scene. What's even more amazing though is how Suma and the girls can make out anything through the dust and ash. When Hinatsuda realizes that something isn't right, we watch the camera push into Tanjiro in his desperate state. This is a bit different because in the manga, Uzui is already fully aware of what's about to happen, whereas in the anime, he's still catching his breath. Watching wide-eyed Tanjiro hyperventilating as he hears Uzui's muffled voice with blurry eyesight makes this scene unbelievably tense. This hazy effect that UFO Table generated is simply outstanding. As we watch Uzui through Tanjiro's eyes with weak hearing and vision, we can now barely make out what Uzui is trying to say as he draws closer to him. Once the sound barrier is finally lifted, we hear him scream for Tanjiro to run. This is where Yutaro's body erupts, demolishing everything in sight. This explosion is even crazier in the anime, as it seems like almost the entire district was leveled from this suicide attack. This is how 3D demolition should always look in anime. Frame by frame, as the ground erupts below our four saviors, we can see the buildings breaking apart into pieces before seeing the wide shot of the 2D blood blades flying into the sky. This eruption is what ends out chapter 94, and from the aftermath, we watch the debris slowly start to settle as the credits roll. Interestingly enough, after this explosion goes off, 
most of the fire that riddled the entertainment district is now put out. While a lot of people at this point probably scream for why the episode ended like this, it's literally the only point for the past five minutes that we've had a chance to breathe. This is one episode that will be remembered as fondly as season one's episode 19, a legendary episode that will be remembered for years to come. And while we soak in that fact, let's transition into numbers time. Episode 10 had a normal runtime of about 24 minutes, with about 21 minutes of canonical content. During this time, I counted a total of 334 unique cuts. This episode had overall the least amount of repeated cuts out of any one thus far. From these cuts, over two and a half chapters were covered, with 53 pages and 190 panels. That gives us a grand total of 144 anime-exclusive cuts this time. Keep in mind that not all cuts are created equal. Some went on for quite a while, but they were among the best cuts that UFO brought to the table. This episode was one of the most astounding anime episodes I've seen in a long time, making it quite the ordeal to cover, so now more than ever it would mean the world to me if you gave the video a like, shared it with a friend, and maybe get subscribed if you haven't already. We've got one more episode left to cover, so let's finish it out in style. Well, that's it for me. Once again, I hope you all have a fantastic day. This is Registry, signing off.